Well, good morning and welcome to the, the 23rd week of virtual Bible classes at the Southwest Church of Christ. Appreciate everyone taking the time to, uh, to listen in and I hope we have something that we can present here that is, is of some good value for you. Let's begin our, our thoughts with a prayer. Our Father, we're so thankful for these opportunities that we've been given to study uh, time where we can focus solely on the, the word that you've given us and the teachings and the life of our Savior, and may we learn from this, and may we be more like Him. Bless our study, we ask, Father, and forgive us when we fall short, as we always pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to pick up in the 19th chapter. Uh, we're actually beginning to, to hone in on the end here of, of the, uh, the great gospel of Luke. Uh, I would say probably another uh, four or five weeks we'll have this thing completed. Uh, uh, it's probably going to take right up close to 30 weeks uh, before we actually complete this. So let's pick up in the 19th chapter, verse 1. If you will remember, uh, for those of you who were with us on our study last week, Jesus was, was coming into the, the community, uh, the town of Jericho. Uh, Jericho being 17 or 20 miles from, uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, he's going to do a couple of things here in Jericho, and then he's going to move on into Jerusalem. So a little bit later in this chapter, we're actually going to to begin really the final phase of, of the Savior's life, uh, uh, the Passion Week, uh, the, the time when he will uh, subsequently be crucified, uh, buried, uh, resurrection, he will, he will be resurrected, uh, and then uh, ultimately have a, have, a, have a period of time where he will have some interaction with, with his disciples again toward the very end and then, and then subsequently the Ascension. So. Uh, we're really narrowing in these last uh, four or five chapters uh, of, of Jesus' life, but at this point, he's just about to get to Jerusalem, and, he, and he's in his community of Jericho. So let's pick up with chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho, and passing through, and passing through, and was passing through. And there was a man called, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now. So basically, Jesus is going, going, going to go pass through Jericho. Do, do, like, again, we're going to have a couple of interactions here. Uh, and, and the chief of these probably uh, will be the, his interaction with this man, Zacchaeus. A very familiar story, which we're all familiar with from our youth in many cases, uh, about a man who was, is going to be short in stature and couldn't see over the crowds and decided to climb up into a tree. And... But, but I think, but I think the, the thing that I want you to to take from the story of Zacchaeus is is the contrast between the, the story in the last chapter, uh, chapter eighteen of the rich young ruler, uh, where he where Jesus was interacting with this young man, and then his interaction with Zacchaeus, and and there's a striking difference between the two, specifically regarding how they how they utilize their money and how they how they feel about their money uh, their wealth both of these are very wealthy people uh, and as we get on into that I think I'm going to point that out uh, a couple of times as we as we talk about Zacchaeus's attitude versus the rich young ruler's attitude uh, which is which is really like I say a, a striking contrast so let's continue on uh, we'll continue in verse 3 and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus he was a chief tax collector and he was rich so uh, now, Matthew was also a public and a tax collector. Uh, we don't know if Zacchaeus has just heard, knew Matthew, uh, knew of Jesus, but in this particular case, we have someone who's not just a tax collector, but kind of the, 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 the supervisor of tax collectors, uh, the uh, a person who is over other tax collectors. And, and the scriptures tell us he's, he's very rich. And I think because of that, I, the, in our minds, we immediately go to this assumption: oh, there's something, there's something uh, selfish or, or 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 improper about the way he utilized his money. There's nothing in the scriptures about that. Uh, he's just we're just told that he was he was a wealthy man. Verse three: Zacchaeus was trying to see see who Jesus was, and he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So clearly, his his uh, his height was was a challenge to him in trying to see over the crowd. Uh, so he's going to try to remedy that. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. And he, was ab and he, Jesus, was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, 
for today. I must stay in your house. Now, we've talked about this multiple times in the book of, of Luke. We talked about it also in Matthew a few months back, for those of you who have been in those studies. Uh, there, are, there are certain characteristics uh, about Jesus which clearly indicated that he is, is God. Uh, and three of those kind of kind of describe that. There's, there's omnipotence. There's the power to create from nothing. Uh, there's omnipresence. There's, the, there's the, the fact that he has always been, he is, and he will always be. And then the third of these is the one that we, that we mentioned the most, and that's omniscious, because we see this characteristic of Jesus so many times uh, in the Gospels. Uh, his ability to to read the to read people's mind, his ability to see into the future, his ability to 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 know what our, our thoughts are, who we are, what our heart is, uh, and, and we see this with Jesus. He's just walking by. There's nothing to indicate in Scripture that he 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 knew this man. In fact, Zacchaeus was just trying to see who he was, and Jesus looks up in the tree and sees him and calls him by name, and and says, "We're going to go to your house and we're going to have dinner." Uh, so. Uh, but let's continue on with that, um, the omnisciousness of Jesus. When Jesus came to this place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried down, this is Zacchaeus, and he hurried down and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, now this they would be the, the Pharisees, the, the, uh, the teachers of the law. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be with the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, again, we, we saw in the, in the last chapter, uh, Jesus gave a parable of two men who were praying. Uh, and we saw the attitude of the Pharisee regarding publicans during that particular prayer, where they regarded them kind of at, at the bottom of the heap, the, the lowest of the low. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we see here. He has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to his Lord, so... Clearly, at this point, you hear these, this grumbling of these people. Zacchaeus hears it also, so he, he's he's going to to try to interject something to Jesus, which he's which Jesus will already know, of course. Uh, but I guess you would say he's giving a, a defense of himself. Uh, so listen to what he says. And again, I want us to contrast this with the rich young ruler, who Jesus said, "Sell possessions and give to the poor, and follow me." And what Zacchaeus has already done, this is the key, I think. Uh, it's, it, Zacchaeus has already demonstrated his willingness to, to separate himself from his wealth. So let's listen to this very closely. It's, it's important. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and I will defraud anyone, of, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. So, Jesus, Jesus prodded the rich young ruler, go and sell. The rich young ruler couldn't part with it. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, voluntarily says, Lord, I will give half of everything that I have to the poor. Uh, that's the stark difference that I, that I want us to to, to, to recognize in the attitudes of these two people in regard to how they treat their wealth. And, and this should be a great lesson for us. We too, in many cases, have, have considerable holdings, considerable wealth. Uh, how do we treat those? How, how, do we, how do we take those monies and say, is this something I'm going to hoard just for my own use? Or is this God's money and I'm going to utilize it for his glory? Two tremendous teachings of, of, of how two different men have have uh, have, in, have have utilized and, 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 and approached the utilization of their wealth. And in addition to giving half of it to the poor, if he has cheated anyone, which apparently the uh, these publicans were were very notorious for, he says, "I'll pay him back four times," which which that in itself is more than what was required by the law for all Jews. So he is definitely going the extra mile. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, and, and I love this because what does Jesus always do? He takes something that is a physical teaching and he turns that to the spiritual teaching. And we're going to get a little glimpse of this here in a little while uh, about what Jesus' mission is here on the earth. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek 
and to say that which is lost. Verse 10 is an extraordinarily important passage in the entire book of Luke. Uh, and it's so easy to overlook. It's so easy to just read that into that sentence where Jesus is reacting to this man. He's basically saying because of your because of your unselfish desires and because of the, the way that you the way you treat your, your wealth, uh, salvation has come. But then verse 10 really is an extraordinarily important passage because it it gives the the mission of Jesus why he was here. We've seen this two or three times in the book, all the way back, all the way back to, to Jesus' birth. Uh, but let's read that verse 10 again and, and talk about it just briefly. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Did Jesus come just to heal the sick? No, he, he did that to prove who he was. Did he, did he come for any other reason other than the fact that his ultimate goal is to die for the sins of mankind? No, that was his mission. That was his purpose in coming to the world. And we can never forget that. We can never skew in and and I think we have a tendency in the church today, in, in all, all people today, we want to fix social problems. We want to fix and heal diseases. We want to do all these things in the world. But our purpose, our purpose in the church, is to seek and save the lost, the same as Jesus' was here. And he never forgot it. In fact, he even, he even reminded Zacchaeus and all those who, are, who would be around him, that's my mission, to seek and save the lost. Very important, very important piece of scripture for us to, to appreciate and understand because it's pivotal in this entire book, of, in the entire gospel of Luke. So let's go into verse 11. He's going to take the opportunity to tell a, a parable as he does so often. Uh, while they were listening to these things, verse 11, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. So, I mean, I mean we, Luke is just telling us we are close. We, we were close to the point where, where the... Uh, where the Savior was, was headed at this point. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was coming to appear immediately. So, what, what, what is Luke trying to express there? And, and we talked about this last week some. The, the, the perception by these people following Jesus of this kingdom was, was this. We are going to reestablish Solomon's kingdom. We are going to reestablish David's kingdom, Saul's kingdom, all these great kings of the past and these magnificent kingdoms and, and the way that, that the Jewish people were, were perceived around the other, with the other kingdoms of the world. Uh, that's what they perceived as coming. And, and, and they can't get that mindset out. So Jesus is con continuing to give them teachings to help them understand that's not what this kingdom is all about. It's, 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 it's different from that. And it's, it's, of course, on the day of Pentecost, they're going to get it. But, so, he's giving them a, he's giving them a teaching now specifically about the kingdom. Let, let's go in, into verse 12 and talk about that. So he says, and I'm going to try to give you, I'm going to try to give you the analogies of this as we go through to help them understand a little bit. Because it's a rather long parable. A nobleman, that would be Jesus in this particular case. A nobleman went to a distant country. So, in this particular case, Jesus has gone and been resurrected back to heaven, or ascended back to heaven. A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself. The kingdom? The church. So, Jesus has died, he's resurrected, he's received the church, and he's now reigning, okay? And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas. This is verse 13. He called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. Do the work of the church. Do the things which I have taught you. Do the things which I have commanded you to. Now, in another parable, he used uh, he used the concept of talents, and I, I think, uh, of course, talents back in, in their vernacular was a little different than what we perceive it today. But Jesus gives us certain gifts, whether they be money, whether they be certain abilities, whether they whether whatever that may be. We have been given these gifts by the Father, and we are to utilize them. We are not to, we are not to hoard them, and that's one of the things this parable is going to teach. He called ten of his slaves together and gave them ten minas, and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But the citizens, now the citizens will be secular, secular Israel, uh, the Jewish leadership in particular. The citizens hated him and sent a delegation to him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. We do not want to follow this man, Jesus, is effectively what they're saying. When he returned, now when he returned will be the second coming, is, is what the idea is. When he returned, 
After receiving the kingdom, he ordered that those slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know how the business had been done, how they had been conducting the work of his kingdom, the work of the Lord's church. Verse 16, the first appears saying, Master, your mina has been made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a little thing. You are, you are to be an authority over ten cities. So this is a faithful Christian doing what God has asked, Christ has asked us to do, and they will be rewarded for that. Let's then reverse 18. The second one came and said, Your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Again, another faithful Christian taking those things which God has given us and doing the work of the Lord's church. But here's the one that's, that's kind of disturbing. And he said to him also, and you, oh, I'm sorry, verse, pick, pick up in verse 20. Another came and said, Master, here's your mina. And it is only what he was given when he, be, when he came. Which I kept and put away in a handkerchief. And I said, and because, for I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take... You take up that which you do not lay down and reap what you do not sow. And he said to him, verse 22, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you not know that I did you know did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And, and having come, I would have collected interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take away the miner from him and give the one who has ten miners. And they said, Master, he already has ten minas. I tell you already that he who has, that everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who has not had, even what he does have shall be taken away. Now, a similar principle that Jesus has used in some previous teachings about the idea that those who will work in the church will have great reward. Those who will not. Those who will not, and this is important, those who will not do the things that Jesus has asked just merely subside. They, they just merely exist in the church. That this is a warning regarding their regarding their, their faithfulness to God, uh, their faithfulness to the teachings of Christ. Uh, and it should be a fearful one, I think, uh, because it's specifically talking about those who serve Christ, which, which would be us Christians. So... Uh, in this in this instance, I think each of us should be very wary uh, from from this warning. And then again, he sent, he wraps the parable up in verse twenty seven. But these enemies of mine, kind of referring back again to these ones who had rejected him, the the secular Israel, the the, the Jewish leadership. Uh, but these enemies of mine, who did not want to reign over, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Wow, uh, eternal punishment. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a interesting parable about this coming kingdom that that these people are all they're all they've got themselves all excited about and, and feel like it's just imminent. But Jesus is trying to help them understand you, you don't know what the kingdom is you don't understand it yet but they will they will. So verse twenty eight verse twenty eight is a I guess you would say it is going to begin the the final. The, the final break in the book, the, the final the final section of, 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 the, of the Gospel of Luke. And it's effectively the Passion Week and, and subsequent what happens after the after the resurrection. Uh, and, and this is kind of what Jesus has been alluding to now for, oh, probably the last 10 chapters on probably three or four different occasions where he's saying, we're going to Jerusalem, we're going to Jerusalem. And each time, pardon me, each time he gives a little bit more information about what is going to happen when they get there? And now, in the last chapter, he gave the most information, uh, basically told them everything that was going to happen, and they still didn't get it. So, here we go. And we were, I think you would refer to this, uh, or, or we typically refer to this as the triumphal entry. After he said these things, he was going on ahead and going on up to Jerusalem. Now it is it is an uphill from Jericho up into Jerusalem. That's why they say going up to Jerusalem. He's going up to Jerusalem. When he appeared, when he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount, which is called Olive, he sent two disciples. And again, this is another place, the second time in this chapter we're going to see uh, the omniscient, the, the, the God-like, or the God traits of, of, of Jesus. Uh, so let's, let's pick up the saying. Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, 
why are, why are you untying it? You will say, the Lord has need of it. Uh, Jesus' ability to, to see into the future is, is displayed here. Uh, to see what is, is going to happen. Uh, clearly a, a trait that only God could have. So let's, let's pick up in verse 32. So those who were, who were sent away went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the coat, its owner said to him, Why are you untying the coat? Which, which would be appropriate. You have this, you have this young colt uh, tied there, and, and someone that you don't know comes up and starts untying it. Uh, a, a not so unreasonable question. Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. So uh, the inference there would be that, that these people would understand that Jesus is coming and, and were, were either new of him or, or were potentially even followers of him. Uh, they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. This was a, a typical thing that was done in that culture in that time. Uh, to, to take and put coats on a, on a young colt, uh, if, if you were going on a mission of peace, if you were going on a mission of war, you would ride a horse. So this was something that that people at that time would, would, would clearly glass. It was like it was like we are paying homage to a king by placing our our coats on this on this young colt and putting him on it and leading him. He's on a mission of peace. I mean that's that's the inference here. That's the teaching here. And as he was going, verse thirty six, they were spreading coats on the ground. Uh, again, respect to to give someone great credence and acknowledgement of who they are and their greatness to take your coat. And put it on the ground so that the the, the colt that you're riding on uh, doesn't even have to step on the dirt. So, really an amazing scene. Uh, really an amazing scene. And, and we get, of course, more detail in the other gospels of this about about psalm about palm leaves, etc. Uh, just a just a tremendous. And I think if you if you look back on on Jesus' ministry, this this particular moment has to be one of the great high points. Uh, a time when, when, for just a moment, it seems like all of this, all of all of Jerusalem is acknowledging his greatness. Now, it's going to turn quickly, but uh, this 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 was a high point for the Savior. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. People seeing this, Jesus has been talking about this coming into Jerusalem. They're just kind of reminiscing and remembering all the great things that he's done. Uh, just, I'm sure, stories being told and songs being sung. Joyfully, with a loud voice for all the miracles which they have seen, shouting, Blessed is the King which comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What we have here is a, is a messianic proclamation. Uh, we, we have people acknowledging this is the one, uh, but it, it's interesting how how quickly the Pharisees try to pull water on this on this fire that, that's beginning to build here in verse twenty. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, "Teacher, rebuke your disciples." And again, the reason they wanted him to rebuke was because they were acknowledging the fact that the Messiah is here. Jesus answered and said, "I tell you, if these become silent, the stones themselves will cry out." Uh, this is a, a teaching that they would be familiar with, which came from the book of Habakkuk, uh, where the idea that uh, the stones themselves would, would, would cry out if, 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 if a teaching was not made. Uh, and Jesus is utilizing it. And, and, and they realize, of course, as they have so many times, you would expect, oh my goodness, this is, this is, another, this is another prophecy. This is another fulfillment of a prophecy. This is something that is talked about in the Old Testament. Uh, so just... The interaction that the Savior had with the Pharisees was, was in, beyond comprehension. Verse 4, Jesus answers, I tell you these, if these become silent, talking about the people who were, who were proclaiming him as the Messiah, the stones will cry out. And then kind of a sad time uh, here for the Savior because I think he, he, as, he, as he approaches Jerusalem, he gets and he sees Jerusalem, he, the realization that the final rejection is near. Uh, the final, the final rejection of, of of the people, the final rejection of the leadership, the final rejection of 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 what they had hoped would happen, Jesus and God, but knew that it wouldn't. Uh, so let's let's pick up in verse forty one. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, 
and he wept over it. Now that that is a that is that is a bitter moaning uh, that's being described there. Uh, someone who is in in deep despair, uh, the frustration that the Savior has, again realizing that the final rejection is is imminent here, saying. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which would make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. And, and what is the peace he's talking about? The peace he's talking about there is the peace that all mankind must seek. And that is reconciliation, peace with God, salvation. That, that, is, that is what he is talking about when he's talking about the peace. And, and so let's reread that. If you had known this day, even you, the things which would make for peace, and, and what would have made for peace? acceptance of him as the Messiah. But now you have hidden now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will leave you they will leave in you one stone they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you do not recognize the time of your visitation. Israel will be destroyed. Or, I'm sorry, Jerusalem will be destroyed because of the rejection of the Messiah. That that is the prophecy that Jesus is giving here. And and it, it just it in our vernacular we would say it broke his heart. It crushed him because he knew that all they would have had to have done is accept. And they would not have had to have, have it, it would not have had to endure this uh, this uh, this impending agony which they're going to have to endure in just a few short years. Uh, so verse forty five, so Jesus is he comes on into Jerusalem, and we're going to see an event here uh, in, in, in our, the way that we uh, perceive things, we refer to as the cleansing of the, cleansing of the temple. Uh, this is actually going to be the second time that this happened. This, this happened earlier uh, in, in his ministry where he, he, he cashed out some money changers, and it's now going to happen again uh, at the very beginning of the Passion Week. And we have to ask ourselves, what, what is it? What is, it, is it significant about this? Is it the fact, you know, every person that w would come to Jerusalem during these times of feasts, uh, and, and we're close to the Passover here, uh, would have to make a specific sacrifice. And many people who lived in, in the cities did not have access to to the the, the animals, the, the the birds, or whatever their sacrifice was going to be, doves. Uh, their sacrifice was going to be, and so they would need to buy them from someone. So these people that had those things would set up in or near the temple and sell them. That wasn't what was frustrating to the Savior. What was frustrating to the Savior was the fact that they were profiting from this inside the temple. And there's a great lesson for us in, in that also as Christians. And, and here we are all these years later, we, we go to great lengths to never even be perceived as using the Lord's facilities, our building, uh, for, for things such as profit. Uh, and, and, and this goes back to these teachings where Jesus was very frustrated with these money changers. Uh, if we ever saw, I guess you would say, an act of almost violence by the Savior, it was this frustration that he had that in his father's house, people were profiting, uh, and, and he, he, he would not accept it. Uh, and so on two, on two occasions here, we're going to see this. So let's pick up, let's pick up in verse 45 and, and see how this transpires. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling. Again, it's, it's the profit. It's, it's, it's that frustration. It's not, it's not people who are providing something that is necessary for, for sacrifice. You know, every one of these people would have to, would have to present a, whatever it is they're going to present to the, to the priest for their own sacrifice. Uh, that's not what is in case here. It is the profiting. Uh, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and saying to them, It is written, And my house shall not be, be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. Again, a place where people who are, are taking advantage of other Jews uh, who are just trying to do what, the, what, what God is, 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 is expected of them. Uh, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men of the people were trying to destroy him. Go back to Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew, the 26th chapter. And we're going to begin, we're going to look at verse 4. Matthew, the 26th chapter. 
verse 4. Let's back, let's, let's back up to Matthew 26, verse 3. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. You know, all through the ministry of Jesus, and, and we've seen this numerous times in, in the book of Luke, we, we've, seen this, we've seen this escalation of the aggression that the people uh, this Jewish, the Jewish leadership had against Jesus. Uh, initially, it was just, let's just try to trip him up. Let's just try to catch him and trick him. Let's try to let's try to make him say something that we can point out uh, that he's that he's that he's false. He, he's 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 not who he says he is. And, and we and we see this escalation. We saw it in Matthew, and now we've seen it in Luke, where they finally get to the point. We got to destroy this guy. We we've, we've got to kill him. You know, in Matthew, it specifically says it. Uh, and, and, clear, and, and here also, he says, toward the end of verse 47, he says, the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. They were beginning to look for ways to, to take Jesus out and assassinate him. Uh, verse 48, and they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on every word that he says. So how, how could they possibly, they've been trying now for three years to find something to trip Jesus up. He's finally in Jerusalem. How could they just go in and take him and kill him? Uh, and in the end, that's effectively what what they're going to do. Uh, and, and they're going to wait till the people are away from him. Uh, they're going to go at night and they're going to take him, and then they're going to have him have him killed by the by the Roman authorities, of course. Uh, but but I, I love the way that this this passage finally brings finally brings closure to their efforts to to stop Jesus. They they can't trick him. They they can't do anything to to uh, to make him say something that would 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 reveal that he's he's an imposter, uh, so they just decide let's kill him, uh, and, and and that's what's going to happen from this point forward. The the efforts by the the Jewish leadership to to ensure that this man Jesus is killed. Uh, so uh, we're to, my favorite part of the of the book. This is this is where we this is where we finally get to the culmination of the ministry of Jesus. And what is the culmination of the ministry of Jesus? The culmination is he must die for our sins. He must become a sacrifice for the, the, the sins of all mankind for all of time, an atonement uh, that will, again, bring, bring the ability to, 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 to put us together again with God. That's the only hope that we have. And that's why this is such a special part. And that's why, so that's why the... The, the, the statement that Jesus made, I came to seek and save the lost, is such an important part, and we find it in this very chapter that we just studied. Let's close our thoughts with a prayer. Our Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He, he fought constantly against men who were trying to trick him and to deceive him and to, to trip him up in some way to prove that he was not the Messiah. But through it all, he remained perfect, and he remained true to his mission, and that was to die for us, Father. Subsequently, he resurrected, and because of that, we have hope. We're so thankful for Luke's ability to, to clarify the story of Jesus and to give us insight as, as to what happened. We pray, Father, that these, these things may make us stronger as Christians, that they may mature us, and that we may be more like Jesus. Forgive us always when we fall short. Be with us, Father, through difficult times. Bless us and always love us. We ask these things in the name of your Son and our great Savior, Jesus. Amen.